Microsoft is helping agencies lead the way in modernizing how the government workforce advances their missions. Harnessing the power of AI, they can drive efficiency and innovation across their operations. Imagine a co-pilot that superpowers decision-making and execution on the front lines. Microsoft delivers intuitive AI solutions that support mission success and accelerate transformation. It's time to unlock new possibilities for the federal workforce. To learn more, visit microsoftfederal.com. AI, I think it's a, a sort of unique category of technology where the capabilities are, you know, new capabilities are being introduced on an hourly basis. And so there's all these sort of anxiety and sort of nervousness about what if I'm not using the latest and the greatest, right? Um, and But there's costs associated with that. There's a sort of complexity associated with that. And so, you know, keeping up with the Joneses is a little bit of um, sort of AI chase at the moment. Um, but, you know, part of it is really understand, you know, what different models and different capabilities it can and cannot do. And at the end of the day, we're trying to be very specific around what are the problems that we need to solve that requires AI. Because, you know, more often than not, you end up with a simpler solutions that don't necessarily involve the level of AI complexities. And at the end of the day, we also need to be mindful of there's only so much change that we can introduce through AI and an agency like OPM. Welcome to season two of AI GovCast. I'm Sylvia Oakland, staff writer and host of this episode. Taka Ariga serves as the Office of Personnel Management. CDO, Acting CAIO, and the Director of Enterprise Data and AI. Arriga has spent his career trying to reimagine how emerging technology could be used to improve and enhance the mission of the federal government. He told GovCIO Media and Research that during his time at the Government Accountability Office, there were purposeful conversations surrounding how many AI use cases could realistically be scaled into production. But before AI solutions can even be discussed, the focal point is data. Arrigo walked through what 2024 held for OPM and what 2025 might bring. 2024 was, you know, we're two years into our modernization journey. So the first two years have a lot of focus around building the foundation. So we stood up the data governance structure. Um, we are com- we have completely re-architected our data and analytics platform to be cloud center and, and and able to do a lot of cross cutting analytics. And so in 24, you know, we also completed sort of a migration readiness for our electronic official personnel folder, which is all of the employment records. And so in 25 is really the the year of delivery. You will see modernized um, data products coming out. You will see the complete transition of EOPF. And then we're very much looking forward to start developing these cross-cutting analytics, predictive analytic projection simulation and whatnot, so that we can start taking the journey of foresight alongside with some of our data insight products. Arriga is in favor of using AI tools to improve employee and customer experience, like AI-powered productivity tools. But with great power comes great responsibility. He described a realistic privacy scenario of an employee who uploads a non-public document into a public chatbot to check for correct grammar and spelling. It's a great use of an AI tool, but it's hard to tell what might happen to the data within the document. Arriga noted that with some AI services, once it's uploaded, it's hard to know what happens to the information, which becomes a larger discussion of privacy and policy. This is where data integrity really begins to play a crucial role in that data governance policy. OPM views AI as an extension of data, not just a new technology. So at OPM, you know, we're seeing sort of four categories of AI. One is more like general productivity. You know, you want your documents summarized. You want to do intelligent search, things like that. And then we know we have a need for a more bespoke solutions where it's based on OPM data and, and to support specific OPM function. And that's not necessarily a sort of a commercial product kind of approach. So we had to develop that um, in terms of fine tuning, in terms of training, in terms of validation and the user experience behind that capabilities. But as with many other agencies, we certainly have other bespoke tools like Grammarly, for example, or Adobe that have AI feature baked into them. So we also need to govern, extend our governance umbrella to those products as well. But the one that really keeps me up at night is the fourth category. 
I call the hidden AI. And I have conversation with vendors all the time. Given the AI hype cycle, every vendor is calling their product AI enabled. Whether that's a true AI or not, sometimes that's not the case, right? But then when they turn those features on without letting us know about it, that creates a whole range of risks that we have to retrospectively address. OPM is an agency about people, so it's no surprise that its use cases also focus on people. Arika said OPM wants to use AI to better serve the public, but there needs to be more IT professionals to meet the demands. Through programs like the Scholarship for Service, agencies are encouraging early career talent to enter the federal government space. Arriga pointed out that this group of professionals will be the first generation to completely shed the analog vestige of the federal government, leading to more change management. It will be the generation that will fully embrace sort of digital and uh, sort of algorithmic era that we live in. And so AI to them is not esoteric or something to be sort of feared of. They embrace it. You know, they thrive on emerging technology. And so I think, you know, it's it's incumbent upon for the federal government to make a federal career attractive, making, you know, the impacts uh, sort of visible, and then, you know, making sure that they have a path forward. So OPM is doing a lot around sort of talent management and talent acquisition in terms of, for example, extending our direct hiring authority, making sure that our hiring experience is as frictionless as possible. Describing the federal workspace in this way could lead to an increase in early to mid-career hires, a frictionless government experience that acts like other parts of your everyday life. Along the way, there might be a bump or two, but overall, a good experience. Arriga referenced the idea of storytelling, including all parts of the hero's journey. Beginning, middle, end, good, bad, and ugly. This applies to the hiring process as much as it does to the data governance policies. Arriga said the pillar of transparency shows up for everyone involved with OPM. To me, storytelling means authenticity, right? Because as part of the good storytelling, you tell the good part, you tell the bad part, you tell things that didn't quite work well. So this is not just, you know, reading a textbook with a bunch of technical details and, and policy details or legal details. And so I think, you know, when I engage not just with early career talents, but with everyone, like at conferences at different venues, I tend to sort of default to storytelling, um, things that we wanted to do, but didn't quite pan out. You know, what were some of the lessons learned that we had? What were some of the trials and tribulations? Because when I was at GAO, my mantra was everyone wants innovation, nobody wants change. Right. So in that environment. How do you continue to push for progress um, and, and be able to sort of push the ball forward? And, and storytelling, I think, is a powerful instrument to not only get buy-in, but you know, establish allies and to some extent converse skeptics because you're coming across accessible, you're coming across authentic. Storytelling also helps eliminate a hierarchy. It allows you to come across less like an intense lecture and more of a professional conversation that allows for questions and open dialogue. I think storytelling helps with the authenticity and the sort of human nature of what we need to do, because oftentimes data governance has this sort of interpretation of more bureaucracy, more rules, more policy that are coming down. I mean, that's certainly part of the conversation. But when we tell the story, we want to sort of engender trust behind the governance so that you know, the folks that we're talking to understand why boundaries are important, why those boundaries then enable more innovation in a sort of faster way. And so, you know, when I tell stories, it's not just about like, you know, lecturing folks around why the importance of data governance, but really share what were some of the missteps, progress, success stories, um, and lessons learned along the way. And, and it, usually that becomes an entry point and willing to engage with you to say, how can I be part of the solution? As opposed to, uh, data governance sounds like another obligatory thing that I have to do. So I think it's important for us to build that allyship along the way. Otherwise, this journey is long and arduous. Modernizing is less about getting new technology or gathering new data, Ariga said. It's more about change management. Technology changes quickly, but opinions don't. 
Arriga said concentrated efforts around human-centered design ensures solutions aren't filled with unnecessary features. From the conferences and interviews I've been in, it's apparent that security and aesthetics go hand in hand. And Arriga fully agrees that AI solutions need to be scalable, specifically useful, and have good policies surrounding them. Developing chatbot is not the hard part, right? It's making sure that we have those parameters set in the way, for example, you don't want, probably don't want this chatbot to be too creative or too uh, derogatory. Or you probably don't even want this chatbot to be able to entertain any and all question, especially when it comes to OPM. So it's not developing a chatbot part that is problematic. Well, that's probably the easier part. But how do we think through legal liability? How do we think through use cases if the chatbot gives the wrong information? What are the sort of disclaimer? What is the reliability? Um, You know, you could ask simple question as what is today's date? That's one thing. But what if I am a sort of retired employee with annuity of this kind and insurance of that kind? Now you have to start marrying multiple layers of information. That's where the complexity starts getting in. So we want to make sure that not only are we addressing common use cases, but all of the edge cases in a way that has sort of acceptable level of risk for OPM. Users shouldn't expect an AI chatbot in the short term. Arriga and his team are still discussing the oversight of a chatbot. Would specific ones need to be created for specific topics like retirement? Or would it cover the entirety of OPM's website? Arriga said OPM is focusing on other use cases to best support the needs of everyone. As a matter of fact, we just uh, recently completed the AI use case inventory process with OMB. We have others that are sort of in flight, but the two that we put forward, one is more on the general productivity side. Right? We just really want employees to be able to summarize content, do intelligent search. And I'm sure you have this experience as well, where you were copy on 20 different emails and somehow someone forked that email along the way. Now you have 30 emails and your action is somewhere embedded on email numbers 27, right? And sorting through that is a manual intensive process. And if you've ever done hiring the federal government, you know that is no trivial matter in terms of creating a position description that is appropriate for that job duties. And so we want to be specific. We want to align with the job series. And a lot of times, there's a sort of great variability because humans have traditionally written these position descriptions. And so across agency, similar job, but they can look fundamentally different just from the position description perspective. And so we're you know, using AI to accelerate that position description um, development process to say, you know, you could enter a prompt to say, I'm looking to hire a junior level of cybersecurity professional to do X, Y, Z. That could be the prompt. And the output will be some initial draft of those position description based on our historical knowledge of what those successful candidates look like to say, you might want to include these things in the position description so that you're not staring at a blank sheet of paper to say, I know who I want to hire, but I'm having a hard time (laughs) writing down the duties of that individual, right? Reaching successful AI solutions means that from a policy perspective, OPM will need to address things from copyright and data privacy to hallucinations and authority. The same thing will need to happen with the internal uses of generative AI capabilities. We're in the process of developing an OPM policy that will govern the appropriate use of generative AI solution. Um, Because, you know, we all would love everyone to be using AI appropriately productively. But I think, you know, the history has told us with every technology, there's always dual use. And so we really need to think through those edge cases of what happened if somebody misuses something. What does monitoring mechanism look like? What does the sort of consequence look like? Um, And certainly we want to make sure that the bargaining unit is part of that conversation as well, since this will have a human impact to the employees. What if the employee chooses not to use AI? Like, what does the policy say about that? So all of these issues need to be resolved in a way, again, just like data governance, so that people know how to operate freely within those boundaries. Scaling also means OPM is looking to share the fruits of labor with other federal agencies looking to implement AI solutions. It's not just about developing something that meets OPM needs, but it's also thinking about how we might be able to start sharing those capabilities so that we're not asking other agencies to develop something similar 
relearn the lessons that we went through, and then you know potentially having a redundant set of funding, development, security, operations, and all of that stuff. So the journey it's going to be lengthy going forward. Like I said, technology piece is the easiest part of this conversation. But how do we can you know scale not only within OPM but also potentially scale outside of OPM? If you want to learn more about OPM's AI journey, you can read the full use case at opm.gov slash data slash AI dash inventory. And be sure to subscribe to GovCIO Media and Research's weekly federal IT and AI newsletters. Thanks for listening to the first episode of AI GovCast Season 2. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. This helps us create the content you want to listen to. For GovCIO Media and Research, I'm Sylvia Oakland.